Welcome to Physician Focus. I'm Dr. Bruce Carlin. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, a general medical term that describes a decline in a person's mental ability severe enough to interfere with daily life. The disease can have cruel consequences, robbing individuals of memory, motor activity, and the ability to plan and organize. Alzheimer's currently affects more than 5 million Americans, but the number of patients with the condition is rapidly increasing with an aging population. Estimates are that by 2025, 2 million more seniors 65 and older will be afflicted, raising the total to more than 7 million. While the effects of Alzheimer's on patients are slow and tragic, the impact of the disease goes far beyond the patient to family members and friends who act as caregivers. This edition of Physician Focus will examine the impact of Alzheimer's on the family and caregivers. We'll look at such questions as, what should a family consider when confronted with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's? What difficulties will they face and what resources are available to help them? With me to answer those questions are Dr. Susan Hardy and Dr. Brenda King from Summit Elder Care, one of six programs of all-inclusive care for the elderly, or PACE programs, in Massachusetts. Dr. Hardy is a medical doctor, board certified in internal medicine, with a subspecialty in geriatric medicine, and is associate medical director at Summit Elder Care. Dr. King is a clinical psychologist with specialties in health psychology and gerontology, and is the behavioral health specialist for Summit Elder Care. Based in Worcester and founded and sponsored by Fallon Health as an alternative to nursing home placement, Summit Elder Care serves residents of Hamden and Worcester counties and adjacent communities. Welcome, doctors. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank you very much. Well, let's start off um, with a definition. What is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Susan? Dementia is a general term that uh, encompasses multiple diseases, all of which result in progressive decreases in uh, memory and thinking and planning um, over time. Alzheimer's, is, Alzheimer's disease is the most common of those. Um, it counts for about 70% of dementia diagnoses in this country. And um, it usually starts with memory impairment and then gradually affects other parts of the brain and other functions. So um, uh, when I uh, think about all my patients coming in, they're often asking questions, you know, uh, I, I can't remember this or, or that. Uh, when does it cross over to being dementia? That happens when it's really having an impact on somebody's ability to perform the things they need to do every day. Um, it's normal to forget a name, to forget where your keys are, to not know where you parked in the parking lot. Um, it's more of a problem if you're forgetting your grandchildren's names and can't recall them, um, or if you're forgetting to turn off the burners on your stove and walking away. Those things are putting you at risk, and that's more likely to be c concerning for dementia. How, when does it become, uh, how do you, you bring the families into the care of the, um, of the patient with Alzheimer's? What's happening there? Well, we usually, we always say we share the care. Um, so oftentimes when families come to us, uh, their family member is already having difficulty with some of those basic activities, um, either their personal care or things like preparing meals, um, transportation, shopping, and someone, usually their family, is helping them with those. Um, and Summit is there to support the patient and the caregiver to help keep that person in the community as long as possible. So you say that uh, Alzheimer's is not a normal part of aging, but we see it more as you age. And you're recognizing this in, in a family member. And how do the patients come to you at, at Summit Elder Care? How does that happen? Most of them are referred uh, either by case managers, by their primary care doctors. Some, many people hear about us from other participants. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that's uh, word of mouth is a very common way. Um, and when someone thinks that perhaps Summit Elder Care would be the right thing for their family um, or any of the PACE programs, um, then you, they usually contact us, a nurse or will go out to the home and give the family and the care and the patient more information. And um, to be eligible for PACE, you need to be 55 or older um, to be nursing home eligible and to be able to be safe in the community. So as we're coming back on this, you know, again, it's that when does that crossover occur when it's just sort of that benign senescent forgetfulness to when does it become uh, actually a, um, uh, a disease process? I mean, you know, when do we recognize it? And, and why are we saying so many people, why are these projections of seven million people, uh, why is that up there so high? I don't know that we necessarily know why we have such a preponderance of the, the disorder, um, aside from the aging of the population. And the baby boomers are the largest cohort of, um, of people born, so we have a larger number at this time actually aging into um, the time when they might um, develop symptoms of, of Alzheimer's well, or do, dementia. Do you think part of it is in the old days we, we used to die when we had that first heart attack, and, and now we keep you going with all sorts of equipment. Mm -hmm. are we, is that part of what's going on? I think that definitely is. Um, most dementias are diseases of aging. Um, de dementia of all sorts becomes progressively more common as people get older, and people are living longer now. So as we come back, what are the early signs? What things should prompt some concern with the family and say, geez, we, we better look into uh, grandpa or we better look into grandma and uh, start uh, circling the wagons and, uh, and putting a team together? As far as caregivers go, I think some of what people can keep in mind is that um, when, when family members or other people start to do things like shopping, um, preparing meals, maybe preparing meals ahead of time, um, knowing that um, mother might not be cooking for herself or maybe not eating healthy meals um, if, if left to her own devices. Um, so it's really about the activities that, that people um, do in a day-to-day -day life that once that becomes affected and you find that you're doing an awful lot of helping um, your loved one, then that would be the time to consider. So, so you find that you're, you're actually watching the, the effect of the caregivers sure. to determine whether or not the, the person is, uh, is actually getting uh, Alzheimer's. That, that if you're taking over some of those activities, that's, the, that's your warning sign, your biggest warning sign? <clears throat> I think a lot of times people with dementia don't necessarily recognize it. Yeah. Um, I'm fine. And, right, yeah. and there's a loss of independence that happens that certainly nobody's going to you know, initiate. You know, nobody wants to lose their license or um, have to have somebody take care of them. And so um, aside from the inability to recognize it on your own, there's also pride and, um, and a need to maintain your own independence. The independence. Sure. So what about uh, the, the isolated person? You know, I think uh, we were talking earlier about how in a lot of these cases it's that we don't have the extended family and those mm -hmm. anchors that people have to keep their memory uh, in, in focus and so forth so that you've got an isolated elder. Uh, how do we uh, recognize it in there? Or do, or do you wait for the police to bring them in because they, uh, they had some problems? Um, sometimes family will notice, although um, many people are very good at um, covering up mild memory problems, um, but uh, people may end up in the hospital because they're forgetting to take their medications. Um, they may end up in a situation where they've forgotten to pay bills, um, and sometimes their family finds out about that or finds the unpaid bills in the house. Um, they may be just losing weight. Um, 
because so you've not got all shopping. these these so. other adjunctive things that uh, mm -hmm. that bring patients to your attention on right. a fairly regular basis. So, um, given all that, um, what is the caregiver to do? What do you do when you you suspect this? You know, there, here's um, uh, one of the one of these warning signs shows mm -hmm. up. What do you as a caregiver or as a, as a family member? How do you uh, move into the role of caregiver? A lot of times people actually move into the role of caregiver without realizing that that's what they're doing. Okay. Um, you know, it could be taking mom to, it could start out with taking mom to doctor's appointments and picking up groceries. Um, and so caregiving for many people is really um, quite insidious. It starts off small, it starts off with a few manageable things that, you know, I can do or my husband can do or I can send the teenage daughter to do. Um, but as, um, as a person declines, as a person with dementia declines and families kind of you know, rally round, then other people are doing many more um, of the, the ordinary functions of, of the person and um, people become overwhelmed before they even, caregivers become overwhelmed before they even realize that they're spending so much time and energy doing it. Taking care. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I see in, in practice is that you've got the, uh, the one quote dysfunctional family member and they said because uh, well you know sister's doing nothing mm -hmm. she can take care of mom and uh, one of the things that I often see how do you deal with that over at, at summit you must have a few of those. Do yeah you? well you know we try and work with the family as a, as a whole um, I think for a family member, when you first think that maybe there's something wrong, the place to start is uh, with the primary care provider. Um, often in a short office visit, the doctor may not pick up that there's a problem with the patient's memory. They ask them questions, they give answers that are appropriate. Um, you know, we don't... We're not as good at that as we think we are. Yeah. But there are definitely... Um, Simple tests that can be done in the office um, if, some, if the doctor is alerted that maybe there's a problem, um, that they can help start the diagnosis. I think knowing early is helpful. Um, there are some treatments for al Alzheimer's and other dementias, um, but even more importantly, it gives everybody a chance to plan and a chance to you know, start to understand what's likely ahead and what resources you might need before you end up in a crisis. So you're, you're saying you've, you've got some of these early warning signs, you've been sucked into doing more and more and more, and you're calling in other family members and you say, whoa, we've got a problem here. Mm -hmm. um, what are the things that we tell people to do? You know, um, a sister who is quote, the, the dysfunctional mm -hmm. one that, that can't uh, uh, do that, who's going to be taking care of mom. How do you protect somebody like that from getting overwhelmed? Because I, I imagine that for most of us, um, uh, dementia care can be uh, all-consuming. It can be, and um, it's difficult to even to if if you're not sitting down with your family members and planning for it and act and being able to um, be clear about what's going on, oftentimes family will be in denial. So you'll have some family members who say mom's fine, and some family members who will say that um, she really needs help. So managing it and talking together is one of the most important things. Um, and I think that if um, if a person who is a caregiver who is providing a lot of the care and who comes up against family members who deny that mom needs help, um, then that person, the caregiver, really needs to um, be able to have some resources to get at least some information to help him or herself. Usually it's her. Caregivers are typically midlife women who are caring for kids oftentimes uh, as well as their uh, elder parent. Um, but finding resources is, is difficult, and, but it's, it's really important. Um, and so that's oftentimes what happens with um, when, when people have a hard time um, 
coming to terms with it is part of it is because they don't know where to go and what to do. They're overwhelmed by the uh, the, the thought of all the stuff that's, uh, right. that's ahead and, of them. Right, and people don't know where to find information. That's that's a big issue too. Well, one of the things we were talking about earlier was the the fact that the old uh, family model was you had uh, uh, the extended family was all around, and, right. and uh, grandpa could watch the young ones uh, from the porch while they played in the backyard, but. Now every, everything's getting isolated and uh, the nuclear family has taken over and so uh, it's sometimes hard to recognize that we're in trouble. Uh, are you able to bridge this with, uh, with these all-inclusive programs like the PACE programs? Uh, and, yes. and how do you do that? So um, within PACE uh, we look at how the caregiver needs to be supported. Um, and we have, we have a whole team. So we have physical therapists, occupational therapists, social workers. We have a home care program. And we have activities therapists. So we assess each individual patient and see, and their family, and see what they need. And it's different for each person. Um, you know, we'll provide home health aides to provide assistance with tasks like um, housework or uh, showering or dressing and bathing. We also will provide um, some for respite for caregivers if, if you know, the you care is really off. overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, we have an adult day health center um, where we uh, can bring people to spend the day um, and they have lunch and have activities and they're safe. You know, if their family member who cares for them works. Um, we look at keeping the uh, patient as functional as possible and making sure that the caregiver has the tools they need, um, you know, any equipment to help them do as much as they can independently and care for themselves. I, well, I keep seeing this recurring theme is that there's a lot of, uh, of care that needs to be given and that uh, you keep coming back to let's make sure that the caregiver is okay. Mm -hmm. is, th is that a major focus of these PACE programs, uh, caring for the caregiver? It is becoming, um, and it certainly is a focus uh, for Summit Elder Care. Um, because without caregivers who are supported, then the person that they're taking care of isn't gonna be taken care of. Um, so, so we will. So for the safety of everybody. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So it, it's very important to us to, um, to help caregivers manage the care that they're giving and, and take care of themselves. You were hitting, uh, hitting a point earlier about um, the uh, denial as part of the, the family dynamic now. Mm -hmm. They've given a clinical psychologist a very prime role at Summit. So can you talk about how, uh, how you deal with denial in, in the family? You know, uh, you know, I see it all the time in the office as the family mm -hmm. comes in and, uh, and uh, one person is, is uh, at her wit's end taking care of mom and saying nobody else is, is helping out here. And the other family members are saying, well, mom's not that bad. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> um, so it depends on the family, of course, and it depends yeah. on how willing the, the family members who are in denial are, are willing to work with us and work with the caregiver. Um, but if, if the people, if the family members who are in denial are not really available to the caregiver, then we work with the caregiver. We work on um, some of the most important things would be communication skills and knowing um, where to find resources so that you get the kind of help that you need. Um, assertiveness training to help people, um, to help the caregiver know how to say to the people who can help and are willing to help what exactly she needs. A lot of times there are, a lot of families have um, caregivers, daughters particularly, who will say they should know. 
and there's not anybody who there's can not know. <laughs> there's not a, there's <laughs> not so, a book available. Right. So, <laughs> so whatever kind of help you think you need, um, nobody really does know. Um, but a lot of times in the families, we don't have, have really effective ways to communicate what we actually need. There's a lot of family rules about what you can say and that sort of thing. So, um, so helping people through that, helping people find either um, you know, counselors or resources or the different things that they need. That's all something that here um, at Summit we can we can help with. And and in general, in organized programs, you know, so absolutely. In, you know, the it, PACE programs. How many PACE programs are there in the United States? Just over a hundred. And and so this is a, a pretty much a movement across the country yes. in terms of how we go about caring for, for Alzheimer's and for yes. the elderly in general. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, even before um, someone might be eligible for a program like PACE, um, there are resources out in the community. Um, it's often can be helpful um, if you have a family member with dementia to um, reach out either to the your local area agency on aging. Mm -hmm. um, they actually have a program where they'll send someone to evaluate your loved one and help link you with services. Um, and a lot of people don't know that that's something that's readily available. Right. Um, so most most communities have uh, elder yeah. services that you can yeah. tap into. Yeah. So um, I, I imagine that another part of what you're doing is just um, improving the collaboration among the people capable of giving care. Is, is that a problem sometimes, improving the collaboration? Well, when caregivers recognize um, the value of the team approach, um, then it's certainly not. Um, you know, it's not difficult to do. It, it's, they usually welcome it and we are able to work with them. And a lot of times, even in primary care um, practices, um, caregivers who know how to communicate, know how to identify what they need and what's going on, um, can can work with primary care practices too. So I think professionals and caregivers can work together very well. Um, and part of it is knowing, you know, what's out there and what you need. Certainly, uh, calling the area. Um, do you do you, uh, can you give us some idea of what some of the costs of caring are? I mean, you know, there are financial costs, social costs. Yeah. So it takes a lot of time to care for someone with dementia. Um, and of most of the care that people receive is informal from family and friends. Um, even with mild dementia, that can be, you know, 13 hours a week. Uh, with severe dementia, it's a full-time job. It's more than 50 hours a week that people are spending just helping that mm -hmm patient with their basic activities and you know doing the shopping and making the meals and helping them get washed up and all of those things. Um, so it just takes a tremendous toll and um, either someone is staying home and spending all of that time um, or you have to hire yeah. help to do that and it can rapidly become very expensive. So uh, beyond that, what is the uh, emotional toll that uh, caregiving takes? So caregiving itself is actually um, becomes a form of chronic stress and when part, part of it is because people don't know what to expect people you know day to day your know, workload is high you're anticipating things happening and you sort of don't know really when, when this is going to end where it's going to go um, and so Caregivers um, have the highest level of stress, really, of pretty much any of us. And stress, chronic stress, particularly in the stress for caregivers, um, can quickly lead to depression. It can lead to anxiety. Caregivers tend to drink and smoke more than other folks. Um, they don't take care of themselves. Um, with their health care, they you know they don't eat right. They don't Defer make things. their yeah. They don't make their doctor's appointments. All of that kind of stuff. So, um, so it really ha it it creates a terrible physical toll because all of those behaviors are not healthy. Um, but the 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 physical toll of stress also raises your 
blood pressure and your heart rate and you know it it sort of exacerbates the poor lifestyle choices that that you're making because you're in busy and you're in a hurry and you're not wa wanting to think about taking so care of yourself what's your advice to caregivers so caregivers oftentimes some of the best things that can happen are that number one that they find time to take care of themselves whether that's to get out get a neighbor talk you know um, talk to a therapist that's one thing but um, but even sometimes just finding ways to um, go to the gym take a walk do something fun um, uh, one of my favorite phrases is um, I like to recommend uh, therapeutic selfishness we're, we're coming near the end of our show and so I'm, I'm hoping that you can uh, there's so much more that we could talk about but uh, it's been really wonderful having you both here. What I would like you to share with us is some thoughts as to uh, how we should um, uh, uh, best care for our Alzheimer's patients, some parting thoughts about Alzheimer's. Uh, I would say that it's, it's important to seek help early and um, seek education about what's going, what's likely to happen. Um, you know, caregivers have a very difficult job. And so, you know, there's help available and they should seek, seek it, it out yeah. and, and find it. Well, thank you both. Uh, Dr. Susan Hardy and Dr. Brenda King, you have been marvelous guests and uh, I think that the work that you do is also marvelous and uh, I, uh, it's been a, uh, it's really heartening to see that we're finally moving into more aggressive care for the Alzheimer's mm -hmm. patients. Uh, that wraps it up for our show. Uh, for more information on Alzheimer's dementia and services for patients and families, visit our website at physicianfocus.org. I'm Dr. Bruce Carlin. Thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Susan Hardy. I'm Dr. Brenda King. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, a condition that robs patients of memory and impairs their judgment and ability to understand and communicate. More than 5 million Americans are currently affected, with most of those over 65 years old. But the number of patients with the disease is increasing as our population is aging. While the effects of Alzheimer's on patients are cruel and tragic, the disease also takes an enormous physical and emotional toll on family and friends who act as caregivers. A caregiver's burden can take people by surprise and seem overwhelming. The stress and strain can begin early and it's important to find and use available resources. So if you are or will be caring for someone with Alzheimer's, act promptly to get help. To learn more, visit the Caregiver Center of the Alzheimer's Association. Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Thompson. Diabetes is one of the country's most prevalent chronic conditions, affecting nearly 29 million Americans. The disease is the seventh leading cause of death in the United States and can lead to other serious conditions such as heart disease, blindness, kidney disease, and amputations. Another 86 million people, more than one in three Americans, are living with prediabetes, and nearly 90% of those are unaware of it. A person with prediabetes has a blood sugar level higher than normal but not high enough for a diagnosis of diabetes, and without lifestyle changes to improve their health, such as maintaining a healthy weight and getting regular exercise, many patients with prediabetes will develop type 2 diabetes within five years. 
Check with your doctor to get screened and tested and act today. For more information, visit the American Medical Association at preventdiabetesstat.org.